very good morning to everybody. How's everybody doing? Whether you're here in person at Planet Road or if you're joining us online, it's fantastic to be together. And uh, I don't know about you at home, but there is definitely an atmosphere, I think, in the room of wanting to encounter the Lord. And like, I want to get on so we can crack on with worship. So if you're at home, it's great you're with us. And uh, let's just expect God to do something, because that song we're saying, we, we give you permission, Lord, to come and do what you want to do. If you're on the live chat on YouTube, then please say hi, type in the chat, tell us who you are, where you're from. And uh, there's always the Connect card on the Gateway Winnipeg website as well. So do fill that in, let us know who you are so that we can connect up. But it's great to be together, isn't it? It's great for those who are able to be here in person. It's great for you if you're able to join us online. We're going to have a brilliant morning together. We have... Um, I'm really excited about the worship. I don't know about you. I think God's going to do something. I think we should be expectant. And then we have the wonderful Ken. He's going to be preaching from 1 Thessalonians, which is going to be awesome. And, of course, we have a wonderful kids video coming up as well. But I'm going to shut up because we want to give God space. So let's pray and let's get into a time of worship. So, Lord, we want to invite you, Holy Spirit, to come. Lord, we want to take our eyes off everything that's been going on in our week, all the things that have grabbed our eyes, our heart, our attention, our worries. Lord, we want to take our eyes off those and we want to look heavenward this morning. We want to look at the face of Jesus and we want to pray, Lord, would you help us to take our eyes off ourselves, our eyes off our circumstances, and to lift our eyes to heaven. Help us, Lord, to worship, to praise you because we know in that place, Everything changes. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And hand back to the worship team. Let's worship.
that second verse again. I want to be near. Do you want to be near to the Lord today? He wants to be near to you. He is near to you. He's right here. He's right with us. He's right in this place. The glory of the Lord fills the temple. The glory of the Lord's filling your home. The glory of your Lord's filling your heart. The presence of Jesus is all around us.
sense of feeling like we can't find our way through and then God said ask of me and I will send my spirit and I said Lord send your spirit and he blew and that fog just went and clarity came if you believe in miracles you can ask the Lord right now in your heart say Lord change the atmosphere would you come by your spirit and blow your wind and blow away all those things that you know are bothering me, that I'm dealing with? Maybe you don't even know the Lord. You can ask him this morning. I'm hearing all this. I want to believe. Would you come by your spirit and change the atmosphere in my heart? Lord, we thank you that any time we call upon you, you hear us and that you aren't just able but you want to answer our prayers you want to come by your spirit and change the atmosphere and Lord we invite you to continue to speak to us this morning whether we're at home whether we're in the room or Lord would you move powerfully we pray and help us Lord not to lose what you're doing in our hearts in Jesus name Amen well, we're going to continue in the atmosphere of worship. Um, and the first area of worshiping that we're going to continue in is in our giving. Um, and that is an act of worship. And I was reminded this week in a very practical way that we were talking to our kids about how we, we could set up a standing order that goes out automatically, but every two weeks I have to practically do our tithe. And every two weeks I'm like, oh, I could really do with this money. <laughs> But every two weeks, we make a step of faith. And just recently, we've had to make some, uh, there's been some costs, financial challenges, but we've, we've trusted the Lord, and he is always faithful. And I just couldn't imagine having to be responsible for my own finances without involving the Lord. So it is an act of worship to say, Lord, in faith, I'm going to continue to be faithful in my tithing. Because I want you involved in my finances. So let's continue to be generous. And we can do that. You can click on the, the Give button on the website. You can do safe e-transfers. You can set up automatic withdrawals. And there's also information on the website. If you want to do uh, drop off an envelope with cash, you can do that. It's all on there. Now, a couple of notices this week for us. Um, you may know we have our amazing Gateway Path, which is a variety of equipping classes for you to walk through in order to surround yourself with community, strengthen your Christian faith, and use your God-given talents to help others. There's Gateway 100, 200, and 300. And it all begins, obviously, with Gateway 100 about belonging. And that course is currently running. It's actually happening after the service today. But we also have Gateway 200 coming up on November the 15th. That's going to be at 11.30 after the service here at Panet, both in person and on Zoom if you're wanting to stay home. And it will also be at South Osborne at 9 o'clock on November the 15th as well. And that is going to be... Just an incredible thing. I won't say too much because Ken's going to mention it in a bit. But we would really encourage you to register. You can do that now. Click on the homepage. Click on Gateway 200 and sign up and invest in growing in the Lord. And the third final notice is, what is the most important meeting of the month? 
Very good. And I heard you at home shout out as well. Well done. The Prayer Summit. Our next one's the first Wednesday of the month. So November the 4th at 7 p.m. We're going to gather on Zoom and possibly in person. We're still figuring it all out with all these changes. But we're going to pray. And we're also going to give thanks for all that God is doing. So that's just a heads up. Get it in your diary. Plan to be involved in that. Now, without further ado, our favorite bit of the morning. It's not the favorite bit. It's our favorite bit. It's when the Lord moves, obviously. But one of our highlights is our kids' video. So I'm going to pant over to the tech team. We're going to watch our video. And then Ken will come up and preach. The church is the building we go to when we want to learn about God. Nope. This is a church. Those are people. Yep. In fact, it's you and me. You kind of lost me. The church isn't a building. The church is the people who have made Jesus the leader of their lives. And that's us. We don't go to church. We are the church. And we exist for the world. Oh, okay. I still don't get it. Let's look in the book of Acts. That's where the Bible talks about the very first church. The people who first believed in Jesus. They didn't have buildings to meet in, so they met where they could, usually in people's homes. So their church was a house? Nope, the church met in houses. Even then, the church was the people. And the apostles taught them many things about God. They did great and wonderful things with God's power. God did amazing things through everyone in the church. Through all the people? How? The people of early church put others first. They prayed together, they shared meals, they shared their time. They shared everything. Everything? Really? Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. The Bible tells us that when one of them needed something, others shared what they had. They even sold things and used the money to help out. That's amazing. That's putting others first. The early church was really good at it. For instance, this one guy, Joseph, sold a field and brought the money to the people of the church to help those who needed it. Awesome. What made them do that? They all agreed. They all wanted to live like Jesus, and the apostles told them how Jesus put others first when he died on the cross and went up to heaven. The early church learned about Jesus and lived like him, so they put others first. I think I get it. Great, but you haven't heard the best part. When others saw how those first church people lived, it made them want to follow Jesus too. In fact, more people decided to follow Jesus every single day. Wow. God did do amazing things through the first church people. And God still does amazing things through his people when they live like Jesus and put others first. Right, because we are the church. And we exist for the world. Oh, good morning. Well, it's good to be here, and it's good that we can still be gathering in homes and doing this in both ways, so some can be here and some can still be at home. Uh, Praise the Lord for technology, but praise the Lord for community, right? Amen. You know, back in early 1997, I traveled with Ron McLean on a three-week trip to a tiny nation of Bhutan. And Now, when you go to as far away as a little place like Bhutan, which is a little restricted access nation in the Himalaya Mountains, you don't cut a trip short. You, you try to make the most of it because you've gone all that way. And so we went to Bhutan, we had a great time, and when our time in Bhutan was over, we decided uh, we'd better head back to Mumbai, and we got to Mumbai, where our flight home was supposed to be, and then we'd get back to Winnipeg, because in those days, our, as a church, our maximum amount of days away that we, we wanted people to be away for from their families was, was 21 days. We tried to keep that to the limit. And so we got back to Mumbai in time to get home within 21 days. And when we got to Mumbai, we found out our flight, we'd been bumped from our flights from Mumbai, which meant we, we'd miss all our connecting flights between Mumbai and Winnipeg. Well, this was horrible, you know, because now we had to scramble to fix all these flights, not just the one from Mumbai, but from all the, all the connecting flights as well. And so Ron scrambled to, to fix it, to get new flights. And by the time it was all fixed, it meant a delay of about three days. It meant a 21-day trip would be a 24-day trip. Now, that may not sound like much, but back home, my wife Fiona was waiting four months pregnant with a three-year-old daughter and a one-and-a-half-year-old daughter in tow, and she was actually quite eager for me to be home. Do I hear an amen? 
Yeah, and so I was wanting to be home, and I, I, I was heartbroken when I found out we were going to be delayed an, a half a week further. And in fact, I have to confess, I handled it really poorly. I went into such a sour mood for those three days, and Ron tried to kind of encourage me, but I was just, I was not going to be swayed. I was just feeling sour until we got on that plane to go home. And I know Fiona was so eager for me to be there and was, was a bit shocked when she heard about the delay. So it, it was horrible. Forces beyond my control had hindered me from getting back to my family. Now, that was the story that came to mind when I considered the passage that I'm going to be preaching on this morning. And this morning's scripture also reminds me of the days we're living in in 2020. Most of us have been separated from each other on our, in our Sunday morning kind of gathering time for 33 weeks. 33 weeks is how long it's been since many people that are watching online right now have been able to gather with us. And even now, they, 70% can't gather with us. We can only be 30% capacity right now. And so, yeah, we can presently meet together on Sundays, but many who, who have children are, don't, just don't feel prepared to come right now because we don't have a, a way of offering children's ministry safely. And so many families are waiting at home for a time when we can meet together safely with children. And I have to admit, I miss you. I miss people back home. I've missed you guys. Many of you I haven't had a chance to talk to. And some of you I've called, but, but phone calls only do so much. And Zoom calls only do so much. And like, I want contact. And there's many people who want contact. I haven't had a hug from Michelle Pilon for 33 weeks. How many are missing a hug from Michelle Pilon? Yeah, there's hands going up, Michelle. Now... I know that Carla Drews is extremely hug deprived. She's experiencing hug deprivation because that's her love language. And I've talked to Carla about it and she said, I will not come back until I can hug people. It's, it's, that's the way it is right now. And that's frustrating for people and we miss each other. And phone calls aren't the same. And, and so that leaves us unsure and concerned about how, many, about how so many people are doing. We just don't know. We can be in touch by phone, but we can't phone people all the time. We can't phone all the people all the time. And so it just leaves us unsure uncon and, and, uh, and concerned about how people are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. We need each other. We need each other in our lives to be checking on each other. We need each other in our lives to be encouraging one each, other, each other. We need each other to just be a community together so we'd feel like we're not doing life alone. And the Apostle Paul who wrote the letter of 1 Thessalonians understood this. And what he did about it is something that we can all learn from today so that we can do something about it too. Paul knew that God wanted to encourage the Thessalonian Christians. He wanted, God wanted to encourage. Paul had been in Thessalonica for just two or three weeks before he had to suddenly leave. And he was concerned about them. And so he wanted to be with them, but he couldn't. There were things that hindered him from going. So God found someone. God found a fellow worker who, who was going to go when Paul couldn't get there. And that's why this morning's message is entitled, God Doesn't Work Alone. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you created community. You didn't just create people to live as individuals in this world unconnected to anyone else. You created us to, to share life together. Even you as a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, model community and you want us to experience community and you want us to be strengthening and encouraging each other rather than just going it alone so i pray lord you you'd help us this morning to grow in this and to learn from this even in the days we're living in in jesus name amen well let's read first thessalonians i'm going to Start in chapter 2, verse 17, and then read the first couple verses of chapter 3 as well. 
But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before the Lord Jesus that is coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ to establish and exhort you in your faith so that no one would be moved by these afflictions. It seems the Apostle Paul had something in common with a great many of us in 2020 and how he craved personal contact with the Thessalonian Christians. And this matters. This matters because it's easy for us to allow enforced isolation to become preferred isolation. It's a, it's, it's a good sign when we feel a craving for contact with each other rather than getting used to being isolated with just me and my own. But it's, it's not that I've felt isolated during this time. Actually, I haven't. I've seen people. I have been able to get out and see people. I have worked with a team of people that I've seen on a regular basis. It's not that I've felt isolated. It's that I've felt hindered. I felt hindered from seeing people more, and I've been felt hindered from seeing people that are online right now and some of you in this room, just like Paul did. Let me give you an example of this. There's someone who's attending Gateway right now who started attending Gateway in January 2020, just before this pandemic, and he's here actually this morning, right, right over there. there. There's Andy. Give us a wave, Andy. Andy has just uh, began a spiritual search in 2019. And during that spiritual search, he, he found himself hungering for Jesus. And so he started watching Gateway online. And that was in, before the days when we had all these cameras and before our sound was quite as good online. And, and, and yet he found what he saw online interesting enough or intriguing enough to come to Gateway in person. And the first Sunday he was here in person, I met Andy. And it was probably his first time here. And so I said, hey, let's do coffee. And so in those days, you could just go out and do coffee. You know, it was easy. And so we went out and we did coffee. And I, I just felt that Andy was so keen to learn more about Jesus that we decided, hey, let's get together more often. So we got together, I don't know, a couple times over the next couple weeks. And then COVID hit. COVID hit. And well, then we reverted to, we had a phone call in March. We got, did a couple of Zoom calls in March and April. Um, nothing happened in May. Then early June, like the first couple of days of June, sometime we, we, we walked our dogs together. And, and that was it. Then I lost touch with Andy for four months. For four months, I couldn't get a hold of him. For four months, we weren't able to connect because our, our schedules kept, it just wasn't working out. And... And I was concerned because Andy is a new believer and, and he was experiencing some challenges in his life at that, at that time. Not least of all the fact that he had to close the business that he runs and owns uh, because of COVID. And that, I just worried. I was concerned that this, this new believer going through challenges like, like he was going through was, was going to just be shaken by these challenges. So for four months, I tried again and again. In fact... Um, what Paul writes in, in Thessalonians be, would be, could be literally taken to mean what, what we were experiencing when he says, because I was torn away from you, brother, for a short time, in person, not in heart, I endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face, Andy. But because I wanted to come to you, and I couldn't, though I tried again and again. That was our experience, but it never worked for four months. 
But then chapter three, verse six, later in that chapter we were just reading, it says, Timothy came to us from you and brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. Well, I realized Andy wanted to see me too because Andy finally made contact and we finally worked out our schedules on September 28th. We were able to get together when Andy initiated contact and we got together and I found out just as Timothy found out the Thessalonians were doing okay I found out not only was Andy doing okay he was thriving and he was boldly sharing his faith with 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 friends and family members who didn't know Jesus and some of them were extremely receptive (laughs) like wow Andy you're doing what in the midst of all these challenges he was thriving just like the Thessalonian believers were. And Paul was thrilled to hear it. I was thrilled to hear it when I heard this news from Andy. My point here is that it's healthy to crave personal contact with each other. And that if and when you crave that personal contact, I encourage you to pursue it. Pursue it actively and intentionally. Go out of your way to make sure it happens one way or another safely. COVID can't stop us from reaching out to each other. COVID can't stop us from sending texts. COVID can't stop us from making phone calls, from having Zoom calls. COVID can't stop us from having conversations a safe distance apart. Let's be intentional about having personal contact when we find ourselves craving personal contact. We may be separated with each other, but in person, not in heart. If you don't get through to each other, keep trying, just like Paul did, again and again, until you do. Paul writes in chapter 2, verse 20, for you are our glory and joy. I feel the same way when I, when I see and hear the people of Gateway. You, the people of Gateway, caring for each other, contacting each other, loving one another. As pastors, we feel like you are our glory and joy when we see you thriving in the midst of difficulties. Because as I've been in touch with you, I'll tell you, One of the things that's encouraged me is again and again when I call people, I hear people who are encouraged in the Lord. You're not down in the... Yes, some people are struggling, but some people are reaching out to those who are struggling. And that is encouraging. I was just talking yesterday to Diane Barnhart. Diane Barnhart lives in a building with, with many people um, who are isolated because there's many seniors in that building. And Diane walks around the hallways looking for people to ask how you're doing. She sits down with them in chairs in the hallway that are distanced apart, and she prays with them. This is what I'm talking about. This is the kind of stuff that encourages me. God is at work to express his love in these days, and he's doing it through you. Because God doesn't work alone. Now, have you seen the old bumper sticker that says, God is my co-pilot? You remember that one? Well, I think a much more biblical bumper sticker would say, I am God's co-worker. That's what we are. We're God's co-worker. God actually calls us co-workers or fellow workers in getting his work done in this world. This applies to any follower of Jesus. Any follower of Jesus, we wear the same uniform as God. We're on the same work crew as God. When my family moved to Winnipeg, When I was in junior high school, we soon joined a Baptist church where the pastor had been a former Winnipeg Blue Bomber. Now, as a young person, as a junior high school student, that was pretty exciting. That made, you know, that made the pastor pretty engaging to me, to to, to have a pastor who was a former CFL player. And he was quite popular with all the guys in youth. And I remember one spring we had a church picnic where he offered to join a game of pickup football. And I ended up being on his team. Me, this this 14-year-old, smaller-than-average, insecure kid, ended up on 
Pastor Bob's team, Pastor Bob, a Winnipeg Blue Bomber, and me on the same team. Pastor Bob was going to throw the ball to me. Like, I was excited. I was into it. And I remember the first, I remember the first time he threw the ball to me during that game. I still remember it. I'll tell you why. Because he dropped back and he gave me some time. He made, we made eye contact. And, and then he threw that ball harder than I imagined any ball could be thrown. <laughs> It bounced off my chest before my, my hands had a chance to grab it. I, I, I specifically remember wondering if I'd broken a rib. Uh, Pastor Bob eased up after that. But it was pretty special. It impacts a person when someone of stature, someone who is highly esteemed, someone known to be very accomplished at something, says to someone of little to no experience, let's do this together. Let's, let's do this together. It causes a person to take what they're doing seriously and to believe that so much more is possible. That's the feeling I get when I read 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 2. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Ron encouraged us to be reading through Thessalonians again and again. Use different translations and, and read through it repeatedly. So I started doing that. And when I got to the New American Standard Bible, and I was reading the, in, in the New American Standard, I was reading chapter 3, verse 2, where it says, And we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's fellow worker, in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. The ESV says co-worker. The NIV and the NLT use the same language. This caused me to stop and just stare at that verse. Co-worker, fellow worker, me, a fellow worker with God. That's a much bigger deal than just being Pastor Bob's teammate. I'm a co-worker with God. The Greek word that the apostle uses there for, for this word fellow worker is the word synergon. That's from where we get the English word synergy. Can I remind you what the word synergy means? It's the interaction of elements that when combined produce a total effect that is greater than the sum of the individual elements or contributions. Wow! I've heard of that when, when people work together and, that, and they experience synergy, but I've never thought of that in terms of when people and God work together, when God works together with frail and flawed people. How can anything be greater than something that God can do? But here God is saying there's synergy when he works together with us as his fellow workers. That means he does something greater when he works with us than when he works alone. But remember, God doesn't work alone. Yeah. How can anything be greater than God? But we, as his partners, make that possible. The early scribes of the New Testament found this so off-putting that there are very reliable manuscripts that don't include this word synergion. Some of the manuscripts, many of the manuscripts use synergon, but many of the manuscripts use the Greek word diakonon, which means servant. That's the word you'll find in the King James or the New King James or the Revised Standard Version. Diakonon. Scribes literally changed the word from synergon to diakonon. Well, how do we know that? How do we know it wasn't the other way around? Paul only used one Greek word. He didn't use both. So how do we know which direction he changed things? Well, very reputable scholars believe that if, if scribes were to have changed that word, they would change it from a hard to accept word to a more easy to accept word. Not, not the other way around. They wouldn't change it from something easy to accept to something hard to accept. And so they would have found it hard to accept synergon, the fact that when we work together with God, something greater happens. But <laughs> we know that they didn't change it to that word, so that must have been the word Paul used. That word should cause us to sit up and take notice. If someone is big and strong, as Pastor Bob said to a scrawny 14-year-old, Ken, you and I are going to be teammates together. We're going to accomplish more than either one of us could accomplish on our own. Yeah, Ken, come on, let's go. 
Or, or what if the president or owner of the company where you've worked or where you've worked in the past came up to you and said, we're going to be co-workers now, you and I, let's get this job together. Let's get this job done together, side by side, you and me. Can you imagine if the president of your company came up to you and said that to you? Well, that's what God says to us. Can you see why the scribes were so bold as to change that word? But what would Jesus think of the scribes changing that word? What would, what would Jesus think of that? Jesus is the one who said, whoever believes in me will also do works that I do, and greater works will he do than these. We're going to do greater works, not by doing something on our own, but by doing something in synergy with God. That's how we can do greater works than Jesus did. I can't believe Jesus said that. How can we do greater works than him? Well, it's because of synergon, because God doesn't work alone. Jesus also said, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a master doesn't confide in his servants. Jesus changed the terminology in the opposite direction. He changed it from servants to friends. And because because Jesus confides in us as fellow workers, he he includes us as friends. That's, That's pretty special. How many of us feel too insecure or too unqualified, or too untrained, or even too useless to be considered friends or fellow workers with Jesus. Timothy had not been a Christian for very long when Paul sent him to the Thessalonians. Most of us in this room and most of you online have been Christians longer than Timothy was, and yet Paul sent Timothy, and God chose Timothy to be his fellow worker in that situation. Don't write yourself off as a co-worker of God just because you haven't been a follower with God very long. God doesn't just use select Christians. He doesn't just use super mature Christians. He doesn't just use pastors. He chooses anyone who makes themselves available to get it done. Regardless of who is available, God doesn't work alone. Now, when, we, when Paul sent young Timothy to do God's work, Timothy's role was to, it says in the New American Standard, to strengthen and encourage the Thessalonian Christians. So all Timothy essentially did was, as God's fellow worker, share the blessings that he had received from God with others. So we receive blessings, we share blessings. We, we get strengthened and encouraged, then we strengthen, strengthen and encourage others. That's our part in the partnership. We don't have to travel somewhere to do that. We can do that right here where God placed us. As I worked on this message this week, just this past week, I, I made a few phone calls. I was keeping in touch with people pastorally, even as I was working on this message. And I, there was one person I talked to on the phone who was in the hospital. And she was really discouraged. She couldn't have visitors, like no visitors. None of her family members can come see her. And she, she couldn't have visitors, and she was discouraged. And the short conversation we had um, was mostly just me listening. Mostly me, I had asked some questions, and I do a lot of listening. And then by the end of the conversation, I said, hey, can I pray for you? And she said, sure. And I was amazed how blessed she was that I could pray for her and that I did pray for her. And there was another person who wasn't in the hospital, but they'd had a serious injury. And again, I just did a lot of listening, asking questions and listening. And as I listened to them share their story, it came out that they were experiencing some serious grief regarding something else that had happened in their life. And wow, they just needed someone to talk to. And we talked for a while, and then not only did I pray with them, but I had a, there was a couple scripture verses that came to mind that I was able to share with them. So I shared those verses. They weren't much, but they were so encouraged. That's something any one of us in this room or any one of us online can do. We can just share prayer, share scripture, share encouragement with people. But I'd be remiss to not tell you that Satan wants to hinder this from happening. Satan hates it when we encourage each other. He hates it when we reach out to each other. Shouldn't that be a reason to do it right there? The fact that he hates it? But 
How does he hinder us? Well, he hinders, it, hinders us by isolating us, by causing us to turn inward to our own personal pursuits. Some might even say to our own selfish pursuits. He, he does so by discouraging us. He does so by distracting us. He does so by keeping us from getting into, his, into God's word and praying with the Lord, which is how we get encouraged so that we can encourage others. Well, God doesn't want to have any of that. He wants, he wants this to happen so much that he will encourage us so that we can encourage others. And the way he wants to do that is when we spend time with him in prayer and in the word. And if you're not spending time in God's word in prayer on a regular basis, hopefully a daily basis, then you'll be vulnerable to getting discouraged. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Encourage yourself in God's word. Encourage yourself in prayer with the Lord and you'll be able to encourage others. We wrote Gateway 200 specifically so that people could grow in these areas. It's, it's a course specifically to help us thrive and grow in our devotional life with God. So I encourage you to sign up for Gateway 200. It's, it's a button on our homepage that you can just click on and register. But we also encourage people to make small groups a priority. And we're soon going to be announcing a new strategy for making small groups more accessible during these unique days we're living in safe, accessible way of having small group. And we'll be making an announcement soon regarding, it's, it's in process right now, we're still working out the details, but we'll soon be announcing a way that people can be a part of small group safely. So pay attention, keep on the lookout for that announcement. But finally, as a fellow worker, I encourage you to take note of where God has placed you, whether it be a job or a school, or a neighborhood, or an extended family? Where has God placed you so that he can use you to strengthen and encourage people in your life who don't actually know Jesus? Because there's people in our lives who don't know Jesus who we can encourage, we can strengthen, we can bring them Jesus. And perhaps you're watching this morning and you don't know Jesus. Well, God wants to strengthen and encourage you. And the primary way he made that possible was what Jesus did on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, he died to receive the penalty upon himself that we deserve for our rebellion against God, for us trying to live our lives alone without God. But he took the punishment on himself so that we could be forgiven. And when we accept what Jesus did for us, we are forgiven. And when we choose to follow Jesus, we begin a new life with him in which we receive his encouragement and his strength and we can live the purposes he created us for. So if that's you, Chris is going to end this service and give you an opportunity to receive Jesus this morning. Amen. Thanks so much, Ken. <clears throat> We're running out of a bit of time, but it'd be good just to pray to finish. I think, you know, what an amazing statement. God doesn't work alone. Let's not get comfortable with isolation because there's an incredible invitation to be co-workers with God. That God would pick us and he knows all our rubbish and our mess and he still chooses us and he wants to call us his friends. I find that incredible. So why don't we just take a moment before we finish. Let's just still ourselves here, and if you're at home, just, just, just have a moment of quiet. Let's pray. Lord, as we just wait for a minute, Lord, would you bring to mind by your Holy Spirit what you want to say specifically to each one of us? Thank you that you want us to be your co-workers. Thank you that you call us your friends when we're in a relationship with you, Lord. Would you speak to us now, each of us individually, as we just wait for a moment, what do you want to say to us, Lord? Let's just pause for a second and just wait on the Lord.
Lord, thank you so much that you speak to us. Lord, thank you, as we reminded earlier, that you want to change the atmosphere, that you're a miracle worker. And Lord, um, we want to pray, Lord, that you would help us to be super proactive this week. Lord, that we would contact a person, we would send a text, write that email, make that call, set up a Zoom call, or go for a socially distant walk. But Lord, maybe encourage us, Lord, to share what you've just been saying to us. Maybe that we would share with one person, whether here in person we can share that straight away or with somebody at home or if we're at home on our own, we could text somebody or call them. Lord, help us. Lord, would you strengthen and encourage us so that we could strengthen and encourage one another this week. Lord, would you help us to be the hands and feet of Jesus to our hurting, lost, and fearful world. Lord, would you put people across our path this week that we can share you with. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us in person and online. Quick reminder, bit of homework. Sign up for Gateway 200. Click on that homepage button. And uh, let's be super proactive this week as we co-work for the Lord. Amen. Amen. Have a great week.